Greetings ladies and mandalgens, and welcome to this latest episode of Tales, Tales from Outer from Space. Outer Space. Taken from the subreddit HFY. The links to all the stories will be down below. And as always, I hope that you enjoy. And if you do, please consider subscribing. Story number one. The Empire and the No Good, Very Bad War. Written by Chaparthing. Have you ever faced a human in combat? Don't. Just don't. It isn't worth it. Because warfare to us is just a conflict resolution. It's an option of first resort. Opposing idea? Beat and destroy it until it goes away. And it will. But humans, their hellish world is too damned hostile to allow for a mortal life form, so they have vested interest in staying alive. Aha! Even though the medium of data state, I can read your freaking thoughts, and I know exactly what you're thinking. If they are mortal, then they must be terrified of death and thus will give in. To a certain extent, yes, they will use diplomacy where we would kill a few thousand, and they will continue being reasonable and doormatish until they're not. You see, unlike every other sentient species in the universe, humans do not have an eternity hanging before them like a road to an edge of the universe. There is a biological end for humans. Sure, some of them can extend their lives by a few centuries with cybernetics, but at a mental level, they're not wired for eternity. And that's a problem. Humans are surprisingly good at judging something's value, be it rare metals or life, and that includes their own. And given their mortal nature, life holds quite a lot of value. A mortal life has a limited amount of time, and as such the most valuable thing in human is time. Time with one's family, time for one's hobbies, and time for base pleasures like sex and other indulgences. The prospect of spending 200 cycles laboring away in mines or as a house decoration without rest is miserable but acceptable to us because there is always time afterwards. But humans, they're looking at a lifetime of valueless time and thus life. And when something has no value, you tend to not care what happens to it. Those of you with a gift of perception greater than us will understand where this is going. For the rest of you, place your freaking bets. We approached the humans with our typical demand of servitude and submission, not realizing what we were asking of them. We saw a few millennia of servitude as a temporary inconvenience, a small price to pay to earn one's place in the galactic society. What the humans saw was an eternity without one's family or pleasures, and in that moment we made our second mistake. We gave them five cycles to mull it over. We were in no rush, a mortal right. Five cycles is barely enough time to put together a sonnet, net alone and decide the fate of one species. Or at least that's what we thought. The humans gave us their response at the end of the last cycle, our fleets returned to their orbit, expecting them to be suitable exotic clothes befitting house slaves. What we found instead were fission warheads and trenches, so we did as we always did when someone didn't agree with us. And I don't mean settle it in the orgy pits. We struck them down where they defied us. We killed a few hundred thousand of the most vocal and expected the rest to learn the lesson and fallen had failed to. They were mortal creatures. If force of arms worked on mortals, surely mortal creatures would be equally afraid of it. How naive were we? This is something of a running theme in case you hadn't noticed. And no, we're not done being thick-headed yet. In the name of the Child Emperor, we would sew up our own freaking rears in this one, conquer the galaxy twice over, and hold mastery of death itself, and you think you know everything. Not only did they massacre our assimilation forces, but they also shot down our ships in the process. We now had two options. Recognize that this species, despite their primitive nature, can fight like nobody's business and immediately open up negotiating table to get them on our side. Or, uh, 
Ask how hard it could be to declare war to subjugate irregularly beautiful creatures in the name of the Empire. We prepared for war. Clearly, we prepared for war. I said it right at the beginning of this rant, didn't I? We solve all of our problems with war. Because, of course we do. How could they possibly end in tears? How a show of force would give glory to the Empire and more tales to tell while we wild away the life of the universe. We beckon champions from across the galaxy. Some astrally projected while others used borrowed bodies so that they could be present. More still, the trip was by warp travel to see the battle in person. In the end, we had the largest gathering of warriors since the time of the Dark Space Spiders. Our armies were composed of heroic figures throughout history, living legends who'd fought in thousands of conflicts and each had slain entire armies of champions. An army of 500,000. So glorious was their presence that entire worlds that they passed descended into orgies of excitement. All the humans had were legions of peons pressed into service and armed with savagely primitive weapons. It was safe to say that we were feeling pretty confident. At first, the war went well and victory seemed to be readily in our grasp. Each confrontation ended with tens of thousands of humans dead to only one or two of our own. We expected the humans to be broken by their losses, but every offer of subjugation was met by fission bombs strapped to a tower of explosives. No matter how many we killed... There would be more to fill their place. This may sound a bit specious, but when one human looks like the last, it can feel like we weren't making a dent. As our casualties reached the high fifties, tempers ran high and patients ran low. We could wipe their planet out with a null bomb and end it right there. But there was no glory in that. These were not dark space spiders. They were novelty creatures that the Empire desperately needed as slaves. Novelty is such a precarious commodity when your entire population is immortal. We couldn't justify our weapons of mass destruction, and the champions demanded a glorious victory, unaided for the sake of their legend. There would be no nerve pinch waves or other non-lethal options, so... We fought them in search of glory that was promised, and we continued to fight them. Cycles passed by, and the conflict lost some of its charm. When you see a human, not even an adult, cling onto a champion and detonate explosives strapped to himself, killing both, you realize what the humans are made of. When you see a legion of men and women die to the last to protect the bunker for the children, you see what they're willing to do. This was not honorable or glorious. It was miserable. We had lost thousands of our warriors to those very same conscripts. Entire worlds mourned the conflict when word reached them. It had only been a hundred cycles, but we had lost so much. Yet still, we did not realize what we were dealing with. We offered peace. We offered them a place amongst us as equals, an offer so unheard of that it caused four dozen riots and countless riots across our empire. This young race of mortals given the keys to our great empire, when so many more worthy races toil their slaves to this day. Unheard of. They refused our offer, and it was as if that point that we began to worry. That's right, only after they had slain a few thousand of our warriors did we realize that we may have gotten in a little over our heads. The humans started this fight all those cycles ago with slug throwers, primitive devices that relied on the most basic physical laws to maim and kill. Barely novelties and crudity. While they threw molten metal at us, we were deploying tachyon lances and antimatter blades, the pinnacles of weaponry. I cannot fathom how many of them died fighting our champions, but with each that fell, they gained an edge. Their short lives gave them an edge that we couldn't have predicted. They were able to reverse engineer our weapons faster than we ever could. After a hundred cycles, they were utilizing plasma rifles and plasteel armor, still technologically primitive devices, but now more than sufficient to kill one of our own. 
We took 50 cycles to collect ourselves and boost morale. We ceased hostilities in hopes that the humans would do the same, hoping that time would allow humans to lose their bloodlust and see reason to our offer which still stood. We were tired and, despite our eternal nature, wished to be anywhere else at this point. It wasn't fun or glorious to kill so many humans. Apparently, the humans didn't understand that 50 cycles were supposed to be a ceasefire, because I couldn't have sworn that then when we started this fight, they didn't have the space-faring tech. Yet 40 years into our cease of hostilities, a swarm of human ships attacked our dock fleet and raided our ships. We were shocked, shocked that the humans would be so bold. We sallied forth to fight the humans within the confines of the ships. It'd be nice to kill a few thousand humans and get back into the spirit of battle. You know, as I transcribe this form from my thoughts, it occurs to me that we were both an arrogant and naive race. Post-scarcity economics and eternity of indulgence combined with technological platitude may have softened us as a race. Back to how we learned not to rifle with mortals. Well, we were busy collecting ourselves and preparing for another clash on Earth. The humans studied our technology. An entire generation of humans raced to fight against us while we rested and relaxed, confident that we were untouchable. They didn't just match us, they defeated us. The generation of humans sent after us was raised without any indulgences. They were hardened and cold, raised on a broken world by broken parents. I was one of the lucky ones. I managed to escape while the human fleet chased survivors to our border. The next hundred cycles were hazy as I spent most of them on an orgy world in Nymphus, filling my veins with every intoxicant known to our race in a desperate bid to forget the awfulness of the war. That idea that we could be defeated broke every conception that I knew of my people. I was broken. 30,000 cycles of self-image caving in on itself. When I came to, I crawled my way off the world, the broken feeling remained, and so spent another hundred cycles in meditation and living a simple life in a monastery enclave. Two hundred cycles, a blink of an eye for us, but who knew what had changed? My place of birth was a core world of our empire. I flew to it and landed in the capital. The first place I saw was that of a human. All of my nightmares came true as I screamed like a young man seeing his parents in the same orgy theater for the first time. I curled up in a ball as memories cursed earth. Memories I tried very hard to purge from my mind came forward. When I wasn't slain where I stood, I asked what the blue ether was going on. I won't recount 200 cycles of politics and social engineering because... Uh, you warp con nerds just want to jerk it off to how awesome humans are. There's something unique that I never would have considered prior to this whole awful ordeal. Generations. We just pop out babies every couple thousand years and frequent local conflicts keep the population in check. Those of you who haven't participated in the consenting murder orgy don't know what you're missing out on, but based on my limited understanding of human reproduction beyond how to use it, which uh, I assure you most of my species has eagerly figured out. Human reproduction organs have a best by date, and so there is a constant stream of human spawn interacting with all generations and picking up tastes and knowledge. I'm not just telling you this because I want to flaunt how I learned that I am, which I am very, very. I have a WarpCon blog detailing how to deal with emotion deities that pop up as a result of unchecked indulgences. Fascinating stuff. Anyways, because humans die on their own without outside interference, new ideas and new interests take hold in different generations. Take this conflict, for example. The generation that we, okay, there's no other way of putting it, non-consensually genocided, absolutely hated us for reasons that are hopefully abundantly clear. They raised a generation that would rebuild the earth who also hated our guts for again, Painfully obvious reasons. But that generation raised the ones that would kick our rears. Now that generation will call them Generation Terror because that's what they inflicted upon us. They didn't see us as the same as their parents and grandparents. 
They saw us as pathetic, all-powerful murder orgy attendants that you know and love. So they weren't as committed to the war as their older generation who was still in power. So peace treaties get signed, but there's still a gaggle of issues, namely that they hate us and we're downright terrified of them. Escalation could happen, but that'd be devastating for both of us. So another generation goes by and they look at that. There's peace, there's aliens, there's progress. This goes on for 200 cycles, and now, I'm not sure, some hate us, a large number have no issue with us, and some absolutely love us and make mint at the orgy worlds. Like I said, novelty is a precious commodity to us. I don't know what the fate of our races will be. Perhaps a psionic plague will wipe us out, leaving our empire to the mortals. Or maybe we'll see the heat death of the universe side by side. As long as the humans are on our side, I'm confident it'll go well. End of story. And that, my friends, is the end of the video. I hope that you enjoyed. If you wish to support the author, check the links down below for the original link. But if you wish to support this channel, there are numerous ways listed down below. But the easiest would be to share this with as many people as possible to help the channel grow. And I will see you all in the next video. And until then, I hope you all have a good one. Cheers.